Hello, everyone. Welcome to Agora. I'm your host, Gabriel Andrade, broadcasting from Maracaibo, Venezuela. And joining me today on the other end of the line is Professor Mark Smith. He's the author of the book, The Early History of God, and we're going to be talking with him about the origins of monotheism. Hello, Professor. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Now, most uh, Jews and Christians assume that God has always been the same, but you historians have a different uh, theory. You claim that uh, God has gone through some transformations, and uh, your book, uh, The Early History of God, precisely wants to look for the origins of the concept of God, in at least in early Judaism. And of course, that God eventually became the God of Christianity. What are the origins of God? Well, the earliest tradition about the God of the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, is a tradition that locates this God in the, actually outside of the land of Israel to the south, in an area which the Bible variously calls um, Taman, or Paran, or Edom, and this is thought to be located today in what is actually the very southern part of Jordan, or more precisely, the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia today, that this God had a original sanctuary there, and over time, the process is not entirely clear, moved into uh, what the Bible calls Canaan. Right. What was this God called in the, in the origins? So as far as we know, it's, it's the name of the God that we have in the Hebrew Bible, which is traditionally, you know, not really pronounced, so we don't have a regular sort of writing for it. But as best as we know, from Greek transliterations and other sources, the name of this God would have been Yahweh. It's usually rendered in many Bible translations simply as the Lord, which is not the name, but it's a title that's used in honor of this name, and this would have been the original God uh, of, you know, the biblical tradition, which is, we have it in old poetry, which is our oldest material from a historical point of view, but this is also the tradition of the southern mountain or mountain area that this God comes from, which is reflected in later material, the better-known material of the Mount Sinai covenant in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Right, so these four consonants, I mean, I've always heard the story, or the theory, and I think you discuss it in your book, has some connection to the passage in Exodus where God says, I am that I am. Now, can you make it clear for us? I mean, what's the connection between that particular well, scene and the name of Yahweh? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, and, and not a simple one in a sense. It, what is clear is that I am who I am, but the expression in Hebrew, Echyeh Asher Echyeh, can also be translated, I am what I am, I am who I am, I will be who or what I will be. So it's not exactly clear how to translate it in the first place. Two points. The first is that the verb I am or I will be in Hebrew does look like it's related to the name itself of God, the four consonants, yud heh vav hey, those are the Hebrew letters for this name Yahweh, and it does look like they are related words. Um, there are questions about whether exactly the semantics, that is, as a, a form of the verb to be, either I will or I am, I will be or I am, is actually the way to translate the form of the name or not. It's debated by scholars. So when scholars debate such things, it suggests that maybe we don't really know, which is probably the case. Some scholars argue that the name... What it, you know, people say, well, what does this mean? It sounds so almost ontological. It sounds like a statement about the being of God. I will be, or I am who I am, or what I am. Um, I suspect 
I, I still think that the best intuition about this, given its context, which is in a story about God calling Moses to be the leader of the people of Israel, I still think the best intuition about the meaning of the name is actually something that's much more functional than ontological. In other words, I I will be for you and for the Israelite people, O Moses, or I am for you and the Israelite people, O Moses, strikes me as fitting the context fairly well. And that may be, in fact, what it really means. Um, so th- there are these problems about the meaning, but uh, there's another theory that had been proposed by um, um, William Foxwell Albright. I don't think he was the first one to propose it, but certainly made it very popular, as did his student Frank Cross, that the form of the verb is not, it, it, that it's causative. It's a causative verb that it should be understood as, I am the one who causes. Now, what in this interpretation, what does it cause? Sometimes the name of Yahweh is followed in the Hebrew Bible by the word for armies or hosts. In other words, Yahweh Sivaot in Hebrew. Hmm. And Albright and Cross thought this meant then that that this was a statement that Yahweh's name meant that I'm the one who causes the heavenly armies to be, in effect, that he's the head of these heavenly armies, which we sometimes see in the Bible. Right. Now, curiously, uh, Yahweh is not the only name that is applied to the divinity throughout the pages of the Hebrew Bible. There is also El and other names that you mentioned in your own book. And the hypothesis that you put forth is that maybe, originally, these were not just different names for the same God, but rather different names for different gods. So, originally, the Israelites were polytheists. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Yeah, so, yes, I can. Thank you. Um, Yes, it does appear that uh, we have quite a bit of evidence from both within the Bible and outside of the Bible that suggests that Israelites uh, did worship more than one God. Uh, The Bible itself has material in it that suggests this. So, for example, when Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the Reed Sea of Reeds, in chapter 15, of the book of Exodus, it's a piece of poetry, and they praise God by saying, and this is a quote, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Now that that quote suggests that they recognize that there are other gods who, to whom God could be compared, but that God was greater than all of them, but it does not suggest monotheism. It suggests that they could recognize other gods. And even the Ten Commandments, which are given twice, I mean, they're, they're recorded twice in the Bible. Mm-hmm. One, the first time is in Exodus chapter 20. The second is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And the first commandment basically states, you shall have no other gods before me. And sometimes this is translated you shall have no other gods besides me. And often people understand that or read that verse as if it were monotheistic. To my ear, that sounds like a statement that says, you shall not have other gods in my presence. That is, the Hebrew is not actually really besides me, it's literally at my face. The word for face is often used for divine presence. So it sounds to me like the beginning of the Ten Commandments is outlawing the worship of other gods in the place where you're going to worship this particular god, Yahweh. So we're not really, we don't really have monotheism yet in Israel's own self-representation within the Bible. Now let me turn from that point to your further question about uh, other gods and names that we that we see for Yahweh. So. We see a whole, strew, a whole string of names or titles in the book of Genesis and even into Exodus 
that begin with the name El. El Shaddai, which is usually translated in the Bible, God Almighty, or the like. And that's really based on on the Greek tra- early Greek translation or Latin translations, and not so much an etymological rendering of what the Hebrew is, which is El Shaddai. Now, the reason why these type of ale names for God in the Bible are interesting is because we actually know from outside of the Bible, we know a lot about a God, a separate God known as ale. And just as we know about the God Baal, who is, you know, the object of polemic in the Bible, for example, in the story of Elijah Mm. battling the prophets of Baal in the book of 1 Kings, more specifically, 1 Kings chapter 18, just as we know about Baal outside of the Bible, we know about the god Hale outside of the Bible. And this has become a, a, a rather critical set of information, both within the Bible, correlating to outside the Bible, that the Israelites themselves seem to have an awareness that this god, El Shaddai, who is worshipped as a god, even, we might say, before they even know about Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, I mean, one reason is because in the book of Exodus, in chapter 6, verses 2 to 3, when God appears to Moses, God first tells Moses, he says, by my name, El Shaddai, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me, but by my name, Yahweh, they didn't know me. In other words, they sh- they show a kind of sense of almost development that older Israelites before Moses, if such a thing, you know, however they understood that exactly, the patriarchs, never knew who Yahweh was, because that name was not revealed to them. But they only knew the god Ael. It's more specifically Ael Shaddai. Right. So it suggests that Israelites knew Yahweh, at some point, but they also knew El Shaddai, and there's other deities who are also in the environment that suggest that they know who those deities are, too. But the critical thing with El Shaddai in particular is that it looks like what the Israelites did was they knew Yahweh is a separate god, a warrior god, but that they amalgamated, or they, Mm -hmm. they, they identified at some level that I think was secondary in the tradition, they identified the god Ale with their god Yahweh, as reflected in the story in Exodus chapter 6. Right. When did this happen, this amalgamation of Ale and Yahweh, that they became the same person? What century That's will we be talking question. about here? Yeah, okay. So I'm going, to give you, I'm, I'm going to give you what I really regard as an educated guess. And what I want to convey before I start talking about this is, we have to remember that our sources are really what we might call the remains of the day. We don't really have, you know, we don't have, you know, textbooks that tell us from the ancient world, this is when these things, these religious developments all took place. So what we have is we have a, we have a set of data which we examine, and the data take us, so far, a certain distance toward reconstructing the past, but I think it's also to be recognized that some of of this, these kinds of questions, can't be answered directly from the data, and and so we're somewhat building, you know, a hypothesis, a working hypothesis. So, what's my best guess? I I see, I think that already. In the time of, of King David and the early monarchy of Israel, I, it looks to me that already by this time, El and Yahweh would have been identified. Right. Why do I think that? Because El does not really have much of a separate identity in our material, at least within Jerusalem and Judah, certainly in that part of the country, we don't really see any evidence for a separate ale identity over and against an identity for Yahweh. 
Right. It could also be that, that we, it's, it's a curious thing. When we look at certain passages in the Bible, some have more pale language preserved than other passages. And it, it has led to sort of a regional theory that, for example, the poetry that we find in the book of Numbers in chapters 23 and 24, they're located, according to the story, across the Jordan River in what we call the Transjordan. This would be modern Jordan today. Mm-hmm. And, and part of that area of Transjordan was part of Israel at one point, or at least for quite a while. And so there are Israelites there. And what we see there is in those two, in those two chapters are poems that are attributed to a prophetic seer. And the name of this prophetic seer in English is Bill Am. And Bill Am has a couple of, has a series of oracles, four oracles pronounced over Israel. And in that poetry is more, much more Ale language, and including even Ale Shaddai, etc., more than Yahweh language. Right. Now, you might say, well, already they're beginning to be identified, but there was an important inscriptional discovery that was made in the Transjordan region. An inscription was found in what seems may have been a sanctuary, a small sanctuary, an inscription that records oracle material by the same figure. The inscription names the figure as Bil'am also, and is recognized as a, a vision, a vision we might call a visionary, but it's really a prophet who has visions. And the inscription records his inscriptions, his visions. And in his visions, he talks about the god Ale. And in fact, this god Ale seems to be presiding over what we might call a, a heavenly council scene, or a divine council scene. And the gods there are called gods, but they're also called Shaddaiim. And this is the plural form of his name, El Shaddai. Mm-hmm. So when you put the inscription together with, of, of this prophet Balaam, with the biblical material about Balaam in chapters 23 and 24 of the Book of Numbers, we're getting a kind of regional ale religion that was amalgamated at some point with the figure of Yahweh, at least in the biblical material, but it may have happened at a different rate in terms of time compared to what we say see in Jerusalem and Judah. Right. So this is probably an ongoing process. It probably... This process of amalgamation or convergence, as I called it in the book, between the gods Ale and Yahweh, maybe it's already starting before David. It, it certainly seems to be in Jerusalem when, when Yahweh is the national god. Mm. Uh, but the process may have taken time in different regions of either the northern kingdom of Israel or over in the Transjordan. Right. And what about the transition to full-blown monotheism? I mean, the recognition that there are no other gods. You say in the book that that's most likely upon the return of the exile, the Babylonian exile. But uh, if we were to pin down a period when we would say, okay, this is where monotheism, strictly speaking, really began, uh, what center would that be? Okay, so my short answer to this question is the 7th and 6th centuries B.C. or B.C.E. And so the exile that you mentioned, basically it, it's running from about 586 to 538, which is the 6th century B.C. Um, and a lot of writers, including myself, have wanted to see the 6th century as really a critical century for monotheism, because the clearest expressions of monotheism occur in the par- a part of the Bible, a part of the book of Isaiah, mm-hmm. which scholars have generally dated 
to the 6th century, and this is a part of Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, which scholars like to put in the 6th century because it references a Persian king of the 6th century named Cyrus. Sometimes he's called Cyrus the Great. And in chapter 44, verse 28, and in chapter 45, verse 1, they meant, these two verses mention Cyrus by name. So, as a result of the, that witness within that section of Isaiah to the figure of Cyrus, scholars want to date the section of Isaiah that they come in, which is chapters 40 to 55, they want to date it to the 6th century. Why monotheism? Because this part of Isaiah has the greatest number of clear expressions of monotheism in the entire Bible. Now, when I started to answer this question, I said my short answer was 7th and 6th centuries. And I said that because it's possible that this part of Isaiah doesn't, you know, isn't the first to come up with this idea. That is, you know, he's got these rather full-blown statements. It suggests that this is something that's been in process already before he's this this part of the book of Isaiah is stating monotheism. Some scholars like to argue that maybe a verse or two in the book of Jeremiah, whose prophecy is a, is a bit earlier, it would seem, uh, or maybe some other passages that suggest that maybe this is something that's already emerging in the context of the 7th century, and then it reaches, um, you know, a greater expression in the 6th century. Right. Now, what about the early hypothesis that uh, maybe monotheism received some Egyptian influence from the pharaoh Akhenaton? Yeah, this is a very popular theory, and it, it's it's a theory that's been around for a very long time. It was made particularly famous, really, by Sigmund Freud in his book Moses and Monotheism. And I would say, really, because of that book and the impact that it's had, it, it, it's remained a very well-known hypothesis uh, more broadly outside of you know, academics, you know, university and college professors, um, it's really had a lot, a long history. Um, it, it's, it's quite controversial among scholars who study Egyptian texts, that is, it's Egyptologists debate, you know, what kind of monotheism is this, or is it really monotheism or not? Biblical scholars debate whether we really see the evidence of this sort of monotheism from Akhenaten into the Hebrew Bible. In other words, the question of influence and how you detect influence has to do not simply with an abstract idea, because there are a lot of abstract ideas or ideas floating around that are possible influences, but the question that I think has made this hypothesis a little more problematic for a lot of biblical scholars is, does the monotheism of Akhenaten look like the monotheism of the Bible? That is, if this was such a great influence on Moses' monotheism, as people assume that's the idea that Moses got it from Akhenaten somehow, then the question is, does Moses' monotheism look like Akhenaten's monotheism? A lot of biblical scholars would say, well, no, it doesn't really. The monotheism of Akhenaten is highly focused on the solar disk, and the monotheism of the Bible is not focused on solar imagery. There's some solar imagery for God in the Bible, but it's really not that important compared to, say, uh, I mean, we have much more imagery for Yahweh in the Bible in the rainstorm right. than we do with solar imagery. Right. I mean, that's what so, Elijah's story is about in Mount Carmel <laughs> when he faces the absolutely. priest of Baal. 
You're absolutely right. right. It's absolutely, you know, much more oriented to, you know, the sun during the lightning and the rain, which, and we can see that in a lot of biblical material in Psalm 29. The rains are important for the life of Israel. You look at Psalm 104. There's just lots and lots of texts that show that whatever Yahweh was really about, he looks much more originally like a divine warrior who marches from the south, who produces rains to the earth, right. and not really like the solar disk of Akhenaten. Right. Well, the Professor Mar- problem, we're yeah. about to close, but I, I, I wouldn't want to go without asking this uh, philosophical question. Um, okay. Does explaining the origin of God invalidate the belief in God? No. No, I think that, that you know, it... it Anytime, you do run this risk, people feel that if you can explain something historically or put it in a historical context, in a sense you're explaining it away. And I, I don't think that that's right at all. I think that lots of, lots of important realities that we think is central to what we understand about the world and ourselves, they all have a certain history to them, but it doesn't invalidate what they're about. Just because I could detail what I think the history of love is, or freedom is, or other kinds of big realities, just because I can historically situate how we came to understand these ideas, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden I'll say, well, I don't really think there's a thing such as love. Yeah, but the thing, but the thing is, the, the thing is that the story that the Bible tells is very different from the story that you're telling us. I mean, the Bible wants us to make believe that Adam and Eve are monotheists, and they want to make us believe that Noah is a monotheist. They want to make us believe that Abraham is a monotheist. And you're telling us that, no, that that's much posterior. So, okay, let's say that it doesn't invalidate belief, but it certainly is not telling us the whole truth in the Bible. Well, let me, let me just interject that what you're saying about Adam and Eve and Noah and what the Bible wants us to believe, that they're monotheists, is actually not quite so, because the Bible presents a story of progressive revelation. It certainly recognizes that with Moses is a definitive moment in the revelation of who God is, and that when they get to Mount Sinai, there's even a greater revelation about God and about God's teaching. So, in fact, the Bible itself, I don't think it's really trying to suggest that we should understand that Adam and Eve really are, are given a lot of information about who God is, or the name of God, etc., that they're being represented as monotheists, that the Bible recognizes a view of progressive revelation itself might be a model for people who do what I do, which is Okay, so we critically analyze the Bible, but we also can sort of understand that the mo- that the Bible provides a sort of idea of progressive revelation that our own work in self-understanding is part of the process of progressive revelation. Right. And I don't really feel that the Bible is totally the answer book. For me, the Bible is the book that raises a lot of questions that the community of ancient Israel debated over time, and that when we read the Bible, we get to join in that debate and conversation, even with our historical knowledge, about the nature of reality, including God, humanity, and the world. All right. Well, Professor Mark Smith, thank you so much for taking our call. He's the author of the book, The Early History of God. It's a wonderful book. I read this uh, some time ago, and, you know, I was... Very interested in having this conversation. Uh, I hope uh, you write many other books, and when you do, well, make sure that uh, you let us know, and we'll have you again on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you. All right. <laughs>